Welcome to our uh, last presentation, our keynote presentation today. We appreciate you guys attending and being here and being part of the conference. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying yourself. Our featured speaker today is uh, Dr. Derek R. Everett. Dr. Everett is an assistant professor of history at Colorado State University and is also a senior lecturer at Metropol uh, Metropolitan sorry, State University of Denver. He has published three books and multiple articles. His academic research has largely revolved around the topics of the American West, in particular the history of Colorado, as well as an exceptional interest on the formation of state borders. This can be seen in his books. In 2014, the University of Oklahoma Press published his Creating the American West, Boundaries and Borderlands, which was a finalist for the Colorado Book Award in History. Um, we we'll also have that for sale at the WC book table out here um, today. Uh, in 2018, the University of Colorado Press published his The Colorado State Capitol, History, Politics, Preservation. He currently has another book being published titled Colorado Day by Day, also by the University Press of Colorado and History Colorado. After his presentation, there will be time for questions, and there will be a book signing near the registration desk uh, out here where you were seeing me helping some of you guys sign your stuff. Um, his book, Creating the American West, as I said, is available for sale at the WC Bookstore. Let's welcome our guests. Thank you very much, Greg, and to everybody. I'm delighted to be here at the, the, the capstone of the event for the Interdisciplinary Conference. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tarnowiecki for inviting me and for helping coordinate all of this. It's been a it's been fun to see some of the panels and the discussions that have been going on over the past few days. Um, my focus for this afternoon is why the West looks like it does. Why there are these giant invisible rectangles with these little bitty thin lines stretched out across the western half of North America. But before we get to how the boundaries are created, we have to start with, with why. Why are boundaries such a significant thing, such a, a controversial thing? Essentially, today, you've got two well-established camps about the role of boundaries, the role of borders in society. For some people, boundaries are essential, vital, must be uh, marked with walls and drones and whatever <laughs> dominant figures so that, that you know exactly where one authority stops, the next authority begins. For, for many Americans, the notion of a border is an essential, vital, enforceable thing. And yet for plenty of other Americans, borders mean nothing at all. Maybe you can look at North America and see no borders. The emphasis of groups of doctors without borders, lawyers without borders, teachers without borders. I, I was astonished at the number of without borders groups that I could find playing around on Google Clowns Without Borders, I think is, is one of my, uh, I mean, that's that's a Stephen King movie right there, one of the best clowns across the globe. <laughs> oh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, maybe, maybe borders are a delightful thing to have if they protect us from it. In any case, when, when we think about the creation of boundaries, the enforcement of boundaries, the important thing to remember is that they exist to define authority, to say these are the rules for living in this piece of territory. If you live on the other side of this line, on the other side of this boundary, of this border, there are different rules, there are different expectations for living in one community versus another. And as far as the American West is concerned, there's a difference, of course, between a border and a boundary. A border, generally speaking, is between one country, one large political unit, and another, whereas a boundary is an organization within to try to, to facilitate the community on a more local level. And you would think, and oftentimes is the case, that a boundary is less controversial, less problematic than a border because the, the stakes aren't quite as dramatic. And so for the notion of creating boundaries between states, it seems a little bit less controversial than creating boundaries between countries. And yet, states 
for many people in the United States are just as important as a, a source of, of unity, as a source of identity as a country is. Yes, you're an American, but you're a Texan too. You're a Coloradan. You're an Oregonian. It's part of what makes you who you are. And as a great example of how complicated creating and, and refining these boundaries can be, I'd like to take an example from the backyard right now. Mm -hmm. Texas's borders and the evolution of the boundaries for the republic, eventually the state of Texas in the 1830s and 1840s, might sound like a topic that you know dates back 160, 170 years. It's done, it's resolved, it's settled. And yet, the question of where Texas is remains open for debate today. A map here showing the, the different interpretations of where Texas was limited when Texas declared its independence from Mexico in 1836, the claim that Texas had all the way to the Rio Grande stretching up into what's now Colorado, and then the little, uh, what they call the chimney, all the way up into Wyoming. Which Texas was which? What, which Texas was, was real and was enforced was a debate then and remains a debate today. In 2018, just two years ago, the <clears throat> excuse me, the daughters of the Republic of Texas, the uh, so the, the one of the social organizations for people in the state, unveiled memorials commemorating the claimed borders of the Republic slash state of Texas in the 1830s and 1840s trying to demonstrate that the scope, the vision, the breadth of Texas in the middle of the 19th century. So for example, this photograph down here in the bottom corner is the unveiling of a memorial to the Texas border, quote unquote, in Alamosa, Colorado, <laughs> up the, just about where the Rio Grande makes its left hand turn up there toward the top. The very top picture, up in the top right hand corner, that's an unveiling of a monument from the uh, Daughters of the Texas uh, Revolution in Rollins, Wyoming, celebrating the extension of Texas all the way up to Interstate 80, <laughs> up at the top of the map. Now, Texas never controlled any of this. If they had tried, New Mexico would have lost its mind. Santa Fe is part of this disputed territory, and Santa Fe would never have acknowledged Texas as being in charge of it. The difference between claim and control. Texas claimed a lot. Whether it actually controlled it or not is, is, is really the issue here. But the fact that Texas now, 170, 180 years after these boundaries were claimed, is, is trying at least a little bit to, to control and say, well, this used to be part of Texas. Well, there are other communities that could make the same claim. When colonies were established on the English coast, or on the Atlantic coast by the English, in the 1600s, 1700s, many of them were established with sea-to-sea -sea charters that went from the Atlantic to the Pacific, wherever the Pacific might have been. And Europeans really had no knowledge of that at that point. But, for example, the map up in the top right-hand corner is the claim of Virginia in 1609, two years after Jamestown was founded. <laughs> so the vast majority of North America is theoretically part of Virginia. The, uh, both Virginia and Carolina colonies had these sea-to-sea -sea charters that extended who knows how far out across the, the continent. I, I keep hoping that the good people of the Carolinas and Virginia will start sending their own squads of historical marker teams across the continent to say, remember, by golly, remember when Saskatchewan was part of Virginia and what things were back then. So I guess everybody has these, these visions of grandeur, of the, the scale of their community, whether it's today or yesterday. When it comes to state boundaries, when it comes to encompassing the communities within the United States, and the West in particular, state boundaries are often easily overlooked. They're something that goes whizzing by at 75, 80, 85 miles an hour, <laughs> however rapidly you're transitioning from one place to another. Unlike a border where you have to stop for a checkpoint, 
state boundaries, generally speaking, you just keep flying right on by. If you're trying to smuggle bananas into California or something, they'll stop you at the line to, to enforce their, their fruit rules. But suffice to say, as far as the West is concerned, you know you've hit a state boundary when you come upon some massive and often humiliatingly colorful <laughs> sign celebrating uh, the communities across the American West. The notion of a state boundary, though, is basically just that. You, you are welcomed from one community that you have escaped into the warm embrace of the better community next door, the superior one from uh, just on the other side of that invisible line. But generally speaking, certainly if you are uh, not, say, on an interstate highway, Crossing from one state to another, crossing from one of these political communities to another, is oftentimes a pretty simple, a pretty quiet, unobtrusive experience. And, and not only in the American West, but across the country. Very rarely are state boundaries prominent. There's one great exception on the north shore of Lake Tahoe at the Cal Neva Casino Resort. Uh, that straddles the California-Nevada border. You can imagine which side of the building has the gambling casinos and which side has the, the hotel and the, uh, the, the dining area. When you go to the Calneva, you can visit the fireplace in the sort of the common room, in the communal room, that has this stripe painted right down the middle of it. Gold on one side for the Golden State, silver on the other side for the Silver State. You can swim from one state to another in the pool at the Calneva, an, an outside pool, so you're able to swim for about five minutes a year when it's warm enough in the outdoor pool there at Lake Tahoe. But the Calneva is very much an, an aberration, an exception to the rule for the vast majority of western states, of states across the United States. When you cross from one to another, there's really nothing prominent that, that makes you realize that. You have a lovely path through the forest, fine for hiking on a lovely fall afternoon. I mean, it's just, this, this is just bucolic, and yet you don't really realize that there's Massachusetts on one side and Rhode Island on the other. It wouldn't have immediately come to your imagination that something as simple as that could actually be a border between a state. There are, in some cases, and we'll look at this in more detail in a minute, there are, in some cases, geographical features that serve as borders splitting one state from another. Rivers, for example, are a pretty common, uh, or at least when, when the states were being created, when they were being defined, rivers were seen as a potentially obvious barrier from one to another. The Mississippi River, for example, a rather massive thing that's not the easiest to get from one side to the other. It's not too surprising that one half of it would be Louisiana, the other half would be Mississippi in a picture like this. Or another river, for example. You have the Columbia here with Bonneville Dam right in the middle of it. And yet, of course, this is also a state boundary. Washington on one side, Oregon on the other. I've so wished that the uh, Corps of Engineers would paint a stripe down the middle of the dam. And as in most things, the federal government ignores me in my requests. <laughs> I can't ignore their request because April 15th is approaching rapidly and I have done nothing. As usual, I'll wait until the 14th to, to worry about taxes, but suffice to say. Oftentimes, just an ordinary country road can mean a lot more than just an ordinary country road. For example, this little pillar right here was the original northwestern corner of the state of Missouri. Missouri today has a slightly different shape than it did when it was established as a state back in the 1820s, the Missouri Compromise and all of that. And originally that was the corner with Missouri to the south of the road and the territory, now the state of Iowa, to the north of it. But other than that, it's just a two-track road running through farm country. It wouldn't automatically come to your mind as this is <coughs> an important place, this is a, a divisive place. Again, another dirt road in rural countryside. This is not just any dirt road though. In fact, this is what's known as Arkla Lane with the Ark on one side and the La on the other. Arkansas and Louisiana split along this little dirt path. 
out in the middle of the Great Plains with my former car <laughs> in just a random road, except it's not actually a random road, of course. You have Kansas on one side, Oklahoma on the other, and in fact, this little manhole thing right there, if you see the circle in the middle of it, that's the southeastern corner of the state of Colorado. So Colorado goes this way, Kansas off that way, Oklahoma down here. You have dirt road, farm country, doesn't seem like anything too dramatic, except you've got South Dakota on one side, and Minnesota on the other. Maybe there aren't even roads. Maybe you've got a stretch of barbed wire that looks like it's just separating one farm from another, one ranch from another. It could be anywhere in the American West, except those invisible lines set one side as Colorado, the other side as New Mexico. You have the barbed wire out on the high plains, nothing new, nothing particularly interesting, except you got Wyoming on one side, Nebraska on the other. About 40 years ago, to protect quite possibly the single most significant natural resource, Wyoming established the Wyoming Department of Tumbleweed Recovery. <laughs> so, setting up the fences about every month or so, they send crack teams out there to harvest the tumbleweeds and bring them back to the depot in the middle of the state before they escape. Yes, Dr. Pierce? Are those free-range tumbleweeds? These, these are free-range, organic, <laughs> the finest quality. This is, this is the Whole Foods version of tumbleweeds right here. So, Nebraska does not get any of them for free. Now, as far as state boundaries are concerned, there's really only one in the American West that's marked in a, a major way, in a, a physically significant way. And that is, of all places, the boundary splitting the Dakotas. Of all of the state boundaries in the American West, the one that splits the Dakotas is the newest. It's the freshest. It still has that new boundary smell about it. <laughs> and when Dakota territory was split in 1889 to create the two states of North Dakota and South Dakota, the two states authorized a, a joint commission to place these quartzite markers every half mile from the Red River on one side out to the Montana line on the other because they had spent 20 years arguing within this one territory, should we be one unified thing, should we be split, if we're split, how do we split? They'd spent so much time, probably more than any other community in the American West, arguing about where or if a boundary should exist, that once they finally resolved it, it was going to be marked in the most dramatic way, and again, a, a, pink post every half a mile is not necessarily the most dramatic story. This is not an, an armed, militarized border. But as far as state boundaries go, this is the most extensively marked in the West. And when it comes to Western states and Western state boundaries, the important thing to remember is how quickly the United States expands and now needs to figure out what to do with the territory it's acquired. When we became independent from Great Britain, when Britain acknowledged that we had won, it had lost the American Revolution in 18, or I'm sorry, in 1783, the pink up here was recognized as U.S. territory. From the Atlantic to the Mississippi River, from Spanish Florida up to the Great Lakes. And that makes it incredible to think of how quickly the U.S. grew. Because in the span of just half a century, just 50 years, the United States triples in size from 1803 to 1853. And we tripled in size with three different means. Uh, we purchased land claims from other countries. The Louisiana Purchase, probably the most famous of them. We purchased land. We negotiated for land with other countries, for example with Great Britain, we struck a deal over the Pacific Northwest, over the Oregon country. Britain kept British Columbia, we got Oregon, Washington, Idaho, that region there. We purchased land, we negotiated for land, or we just took it. Uh, for example, American settlers moving into Texas, and then the Texas Revolution, the invasion of northern Mexico in the 1840s and the war between the U.S. and Mexico that leads to, this, uh, to the transfer of all of the rest of northern Mexico to become the southwest. 
And that happens in just 50 years, tripling the size of the United States at an incredibly rapid pace. But the important thing to remember, whether it's purchase, whether it's negotiation, whether it's conquest, all of that land was just claimed by the U.S. And you can claim whatever you want, but if you don't control it, your claim doesn't really mean that much. So if the United States is going to hold on to this territory, if it's going to develop it and make it work, make it fit within the rest of the established pink blob over here on the east, we needed to do two things. First off, we needed to fill the rest of this area with people who had the same sort of political ideas, the same economic ideas. That's how you get things like the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, the California Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, sending Americans out into the West to try to develop it politically and economically in ways that were familiar, that would fit with the Eastern states, the established states at the beginning of the 1800s. And the second thing that we had to do was we had to divide up these huge swaths of territory into manageable chunks, into pieces that would fit politically, but also practically, with the patterns that had been established east of the Mississippi River. And that's how the state-making process comes about. You needed to take these massive pieces of territory, about which Americans knew very little, and figure out how to shape them into effective, efficient, cohesive states. Communities that could support themselves, that could be eventually equal players in the club with Kentucky and Virginia and Delaware and the rest. When we're talking about the Trans-Mississippi West, the area of the United States west of the Mississippi that's acquired in such a rapid fashion in such a, sh a short period of time, there were two big arguments about how to create states west of the Mississippi. And the argument essentially boils down into whether we're going to use geometry or geography. Geography was the use of natural features of, in particular, rivers or mountain ranges to divide up the territory in the west. Geometry was the use of, of straight lines of the uh, so simple, practical, easy to define. And of these two, of the two options of geometry or geography, today, generally speaking, we look at the map of the United States, we look at the giant invisible rectangles, and we say, what the hell really that? <laughs> I mean, I, I say that, and I'm, and I'm on camera, and this is going to get me in trouble, I'm sure, because it'll be leaked, and it'll be scandalous on Denver News. There's no reason for Colorado to exist. This giant <laughs> rectangle out there that brings together cultures and environments and ideologies that don't necessarily have anything in common. And you can say that about practically every one of the giant geometric things out there in the West. They were not embraced. They were not shaped geographically. Large, by large uh, speaking, there are very few geographic features used for boundaries in the West. And we think it would make more, much more sense if you had mountains, if you had rivers, instead of these invisible lines that you know, might have a barbed wire fence or a dirt road or something along it. But you, know, you saw Minnesota on one side, South Dakota on the other. It looked the same thing. Why shouldn't those places be in the same political community? Well, let's start with the idea of geography. And, spoiler alert, why having geographic boundaries is a terrible idea, is a ridiculous, <laughs> horrifying idea. We'll start out of the two options with rivers. As I said, there are really two geographic concepts that could shape western uh, territories and the states, rivers or mountains. So we'll start with rivers. Rivers are quite possibly the single dumbest thing to use when you're making a boundary. Because with very few exceptions, rivers don't stay put. You tend to think, there's a map, there's rivers on it. I've had to study something like this for a geography class, for a history class. I've had to know that that's the Mississippi, the Mississippi's there. The Mississippi is not going to be over here next week. And that's true, but 
thanks to the natural ge geological and, and environmental processes, rivers tend to migrate a little bit. They move around a bit, not necessarily in any massive ways, but enough that makes rivers ridiculous to be used as borders. If you have a river that's in a canyon, for example, Hell's Canyon for the Snake River between Idaho and Oregon, that river's not going anywhere. But if you have a river out on the plains, if you have, for example, the Mississippi River, those rivers tend not to stay where they're supposed to stay. These are two maps of the Mississippi River between, <coughs> excuse me, between parts of Arkansas and Mississippi in the early 20th century and showing the number of times the river has moved, has had a little loop that then the loop got cut off. This is the problem of using rivers as borders because if you say, let's go back here for a second, if you say we're going to use the Mississippi River as a line to separate one political community from another, what happens if that river changes its course? Even a tiny bit, because the essential role of a boundary is to define authority. These are the rules of our community. If you live in this area, these are the rules. If you live on this side of the line, there are different rules. If you've used a river, the river might change, but according to Supreme Court decisions going back to the 1840s, boundaries don't change just because a river did. So, for example, and to this day, if you look at a, a topo map, of the Mississippi River Valley, you'll see these little tiny pieces of Arkansas, of Tennessee, of Louisiana, of Mississippi, of Illinois, of Missouri, theoretically on the wrong side. There's these, these little islands, these little pockets, because the boundaries when they were established in the 1800s were set by law. The boundaries don't change unless those two states and Congress say they can even if the river has changed, which means that all along, not just the Mississippi River, but the Missouri River, the Red River, between Texas and Oklahoma, the Ohio, any river that has shifted even a little bit, means that there's now a tiny little piece of one state physically separated. And what happens if you had a farm on one side of the river, there was a flood, and when the waters dropped back down, suddenly, your farm is still there, but it's attached to the other side of the river, attached to a community on the other side. Well, you're still part of whatever state you started out in. But if you have a problem, if, if there's a crime that's been committed on your farm, you've got to call the sheriff from the other side of the river, and it's going to take them about 100 miles to get to the nearest bridge and loop back around to you. These, these little pieces of states that ended up being chopped off and attached to their neighboring communities in the 19th century in particular were places of the most wondrous, joyful law-breaking that there could <laughs> ever be. Because you're committing a crime that, let, let's, let's say the river is right here, it used to be over here, but now that it's right here, I'm in the part of the state that should be over there, but it's going to take them, in the 19th century, three days to get over to me. If I shoot somebody here, I've committed a crime, but only this state can really enforce it. And they don't care because of that invisible line that says it's not their problem. A colleague of mine, and Dr. Pierce and Dr. Fink from the University of Arkansas, studied the history of dueling in the 19th century. And this was a big uh, issue when it came to fighting duels, fighting to these, these contests of honor because dueling was against the law in essentially every state, but if you had one of these little lawless areas nearby, you could travel you know, half a mile over here, shoot at each other, and let's say one person was killed, it wouldn't be enforced because the state that physically isn't attached can't get to you, and you go back to the other state where you technically haven't committed a crime because you crossed that invisible line five feet over, you shot someone in Arkansas, but you're in Tennessee. Tennessee is not going to uh, put you on trial for a crime that com was committed outside of the state. Rivers are horrible, horrible, <laughs> ridiculous boundaries and should be ignored and dismissed. In fact, uh, there are a number of times 
uh, across the 20th into the 21st century that states in the middle of the United States have held conventions to reassign pieces that, you know, say uh, there's been a flood and suddenly Missouri's got some pieces of land on one side and Kansas and Nebraska have some pieces, they, they've accidentally exchanged chunks of land. And states have had conventions to officially reassign those pieces to each other so that you now have law and order. It's as if your house didn't change, your farm didn't change, the river did, and now all of a sudden you're in Missouri, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So, the, and, and these conventions have been held with, with regularity ever since the 19th century, except for some states they've gotten to the point of why bother? Because as soon as we reassign the pieces of land, the river's going to flood again. And then we're going to have random pieces of Horrible, ignore rivers, dismiss rivers, make rude gestures the next time you cross a river that suggests it is worthy of being a boundary. None of this. So, rivers are bad because they don't stay put. This would suggest, therefore, that if you're going to make a boundary with geography, you want something that is immovable. For example, a mountain range. What a perfect idea. To have as a border. It's not going anywhere. It's not moving. Well, it, it might be eroding over the next several hundred million years, but that'll be future generations' problem to deal with. For us, maybe a, 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 a mountain boundary would be a good idea. In fact, in the late 1800s, this was a popular enough notion that a Western explorer by the name of John Wesley Powell in the uh, 1880s came up with this proposed map of the American West. John Wesley Powell was the first American to lead an expedition down the Colorado River, one-armed Civil War veteran, Union side. And as far as Powell was concerned, the smartest way to organize the American West would be along river basins, drainage basins, essentially. Powell was one of the first Americans to realize just how essential, just how controversial the issue of water management was going to be. So why not have communities that existed with a river at the center of them? That, for example, you would have one state for the Rio Grande. You'd have one state for the drainage of the Arkansas and the Red River. You'd have one state for the lower Colorado River. You'd have one big yellow state with no rivers at all here in California, Nevada, and so on. The idea being that if states were organized by drainage basins, it would be a, a simple manner of, of enforcement that you would have essentially a self-contained community, all drawing on that one vital resource of water. Bad idea. Because, yes, these mountain ranges aren't going to move, but the fundamental purpose of a boundary is to define authority, to define rules and regulations and expectations and all of that. And the challenge is if you've declared, say, for example, uh, the, the Continental Divide to be part of the boundary of your state, that means that survey teams have to go up into the mountains, have to go along these these lines of peaks or drainage basins or whatever and figure out exactly, exactly where that line is. That if a drop of water falls, it's going to go into the Colorado and not into the Rio Grande. You have to have absolute certainty with a boundary. You need to know which side you're on so that if there's a crime committed, if there's a need to enforce property rights, you need to know exactly which side you're on. A good example of, of how complicated this notion of a mountain boundary would be is California and Nevada. To this day, the California and Nevada state constitutions have different definitions of the border between them. And every once in a while, Nevada tries to convince California to change. California was created in 1850 with the geometric, with the straight lines that we recognize today with its little hinge here in the southern end of Lake Tahoe. That was a complete, just dumb luck accident. Nobody had cl any clue that this essential turn in the border was going to be in the middle of the lake. It didn't really help things that much. When Nevada was established as a territory, though, 
just a little bit after California became a state, Nevada's border was the crest of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So a little bit farther to the west than the uh, geographic line, or I'm sorry, the geometric line that exists today. Because as far as the residents of Nevada were concerned, this just makes sense to have our divide be the summit of the mountains that are essentially between our two communities. It, it would be a practical thing, it'd be a logical thing. And they tried to convince California of this. Nevada has tried, I think most recently, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a, an election in Nevada to try to convince California to change California's border to move it to the crest of the Sierra Nevadas. And this idea has been rejected since the 1860s, since Nevada territory was organized. There was a, Cal <coughs> excuse me, a California state politician who said, if we declare the summit of the Sierras to be the border, there will not be a moment in the next 6,000 years where we, where we would actually agree where the line was. Because if you've ever spent any time in a mountain range, Continental Divide, for example, through, through much of the American West, it's not like there's this little dashed line on the top of those peaks. Aha, if that snowflake falls there, then it's going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico, and this one's going to end up in the Pacific Ocean, you'd have to have surveying teams up in these incredibly harsh, bitter conditions trying to define something that is essential and not just, say, for uh, enforcing law and order, whether there's uh, a crime, a murder, or something that's been committed. These are mountain ranges. You're going to have mining claims in the mountains. What happens if one state's mining laws are different from another state's? If you're digging your way through the mountains and you don't know exactly where that line is, you're going to have, as, as everything, it boils down to the only people who will win in any story are the lawyers. <laughs> and you'll just have nothing but lawsuits for the rest of time over whose authority stands where. So geography sounds good. Rivers, at first glance, mountains at first glance sound good, and yet there are massive practical problems that the definition of law enforcement, of law and order, makes it impossible to look to these boundaries, to look to these uh, uh, ge geographical features as useful boundaries. Which brings us back, as sad, as disappointing, as frustrating as it might be, to the glory that is geometry. I say that having come very close to having failed geometry. And so I stand up here pretending to know something that Mr. Robson will tell you I don't know from all the ground. So the reason geometry becomes the solution is because it is simple. Because it can be easily, clearly, immediately defined. You don't have to try to wonder where exactly, okay, is, if the river is going to be the border, are we going to draw a line down the middle of the river? Where exactly is the middle of the river? When it comes to geometry, things are much, much more simple. And this starts, this idea of extending geometry into the American West starts, in of all places, Ohio in 1785, with what was called the Land Ordinance, when the federal government comes up with a policy technically what even the federal government, then the confederation government, came up with a policy for dividing up land in the West into easily defined and easily sellable squares. So you can define exactly by township, by range, which square you're talking about in Ohio that is then divided up into smaller and smaller and smaller squares, ultimately uh, quarter mile, square quarter mile, square half mile, so on and so forth something that can be easily defined, easily sold, <coughs> to make money for the government, yes, but more importantly, to get as many people out in the West as possible, to fill the region of the West with Americans, so that Americans can control what they're claiming. You've claimed this huge chunk of land, but until you've got people with those same ideologies, they're not actually controlling it. So the land ordinance, starting here in Ohio, in the 1780s and eventually extending across the vast majority of North America, the same policies, the same land ownership policies that worked for the 1780s along the Ohio River have been extended to most of 
the United States beyond, including Alaska, not counting, of course, Texas, which had its own law, uh, land division policies that were drawn up uh, uh, at the time of independence and have been retained ever since. But for the vast majority of the rest of the continent, when you fly over North America, you look out the window and there are all those squares. And the reason there are all those squares is because of the land ordinance of 1785, starting in Ohio, that was such a simple, practical thing that we could extend it across the rest of the continent. And if it works for land ownership, it's going to work for political communities as well. It's going to work for places that need to be quickly defined, easily enforced. You can send a surveying team out to say, all right, here, this is where the invisible line is going to be. If you're on this side, you're in Wyoming. If you're in this side, you're in Nebraska. And these are the rules of living on each side of that invisible line. We're not trying to guess where the river might be. We're not trying to guess where exactly the divide on the mountains are. Let's put it this way. Of all of the boundary, of all the state boundaries west of the Mississippi River, a third of them, either in whole or in part, use rivers. Only one uses in part a mountain range, part of the border between Idaho and Montana. All of the others, for essentially the two-thirds of the borders across, state boundaries across the American West, consist entirely of geometry. They slice through environments, they slice through cultures that shouldn't necessarily be divided, and yet, for the political system, for the governmental system the United States was trying to enforce, this is the simplest way. This is the easiest way for the federal government to get what, it's, what it wants, what it needs out of the American West, to create wonderful photo opportunities for people to stand together at places like Four Corners and hold hands and smile and think how fun it is to be in four states all at the same time with my friends, all sharing the experience together. There are, without a doubt, major consequences that come or have come about from the creation of these boundaries, of these state lines. I have to pause for a moment and recognize the absurdity of this sign in particular. This is just outside of Maysville, Arkansas, northwestern corner of the state. I have parked in front of this highway sign out in the middle of farm country probably a half dozen times over the years, and I have spoken with it at length informing it that it's, it's impossible, it cannot exist, and there it is, it doesn't care. I, you, you can't have all of these roads on the same place, that I, don't, I don't know. But suffice to say, whether it's Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, any other community, the consequences of these boundaries, of these places that were placed down mostly by geometry, have resonated over the years. Most importantly, most significantly, the creation of these boundaries, as I mentioned earlier, creates new identities, creates a new community that we want to belong to. We're humans. We like, we like to be parts of groups. We like to say, I'm a member of, of this club, and I'm not a member of that other lesser group of people. I am a Texan. I am not, God help me, an Oklahoman. Because we know what those people are like over on that other invisible side of the line that apparently suddenly transforms someone else into being less than we are, and we are greater than them. These identities are, are, are cherished to the point that not only do, do, you, do you love the name, do you love that, that notion of being a, a resident of the equality state or the evergreen state or big sky country or, or whatever, but... The, the, the physical existence of your community, quite simply, the shape becomes so essential. And, and let's face it, there is no state more in love with its shape than Texas. You can get anything you want in Texas. You want Texas waffles, you want your Texas house with a Texas swimming pool, and your Texas lollipops, and Texas everything. There is, there is no state more impassioned about its shape. And of course, I, you might know this, that 
Texas is the only state in the entire country that because of the rules when it was admitted into the Union, Texas is the only state that could theoretically subdivide itself if it, if it wanted to. Every other state would have to get permission from Congress to change its boundaries. You know, when, when we're moving little pieces of land from one side of the river to the other, Congress has to be a part of that. Texas could do it by itself. I would I will go on the record right here in Weatherford, Texas on the 27th of February 2020 and say it's never going to happen because that is so essential. If, if Texas divides itself, for one thing, who gets to be Texas? And who's going to be something else? Who's going to be another name? Even if it's, you know, who wants to be North Texas? Because North Texas isn't real Texas. Yeah. It's not happening. This is too essential, too vital. And the notion of these, these physical shapes that define us show up in, in the most ridiculous ways. About 10 years ago, Colorado built a new state history museum, and I was at the dedication ceremony for it, where the architect spoke about how he, he took inspiration for designing the building from the shape of the state of Colorado. He goes, I'm, and I'm thinking, this is a rectangular state with a rectangular building. Boy, someone, someone went to imagination school that day. Wow. I mean, if it was the Florida Museum or the Texas Museum, sure, all right. But yeah, alas, Colorado and Wyoming have those crosses to bear for the rest of time. In any case, the consequences of living in one of these <coughs> Western communities often create problems, often create challenges that people who, especially for those who live close to the edges, the people who live in the middle of the community don't necessarily feel. When I lived in Arkansas, I got my uh, doctorate at the University of Arkansas, and I'm pretty sure every year I, I did my taxes, relatively certain I did that, there was always a space on the state tax form that had a special section for the people who live in Texarkana. Because if you live in Texarkana, you are probably likely to live in one place but work in another. And so you paid a special kind of tax. In fact, you actually got a, a rebate that the rest of the state didn't get if you lived in the Arkansas Texarkana, but probably worked in the Texas Texarkana where most of the businesses are. There's a community called Wendover that has been going through this debate for years. Wendover is on the Utah-Nevada line. This is a picture of the main street in Wendover here. And kind of the same story. Most of the people who... Uh, live in Wendover, live on the Utah side, but they work where all the casinos are on the Nevada side. It's right there along the Interstate 80 if you're leaving Utah, leaving Great Salt Lake Valley, headed out toward the Pacific Coast. And there have been proposals for the Utah side to secede from Utah and join Nevada so that everybody can live in the same community, you can have all the same rules instead of having different taxes, different rules, depending on which side of the invisible line you live on. It hasn't happened yet, but the proposals are out there. And these issues are nothing new. In the 1830s, there was a culture that lived between what's now Missouri and Iowa Territory, along that, that two-track line uh, between these two communities. A group of people in the 1830s, before the boundary had really been surveyed and clearly defined, that called themselves the Hairy Nation. And I, I can appreciate, I can sympathize with the, the, the furriness here. The Harry Nation was famous for playing that, that vague boundary to their advantage. If you lived in this unclear region and the sheriff from the Missouri County showed up to collect taxes, you'd say, well, I'm, I don't live in Missouri, I live in Iowa. And then the next day when the Iowa sheriff showed up to collect taxes, I don't live in Iowa, I live in Missouri. So you, you make the border work for you. <laughs> You, you find a power in this marginal space that you wouldn't have had if you lived in Des Moines or Jefferson City or whatever. That being said, for plenty of people, these boundaries and the, the, the challenges that they pose make you think, let's have new boundaries. Let's change them because I don't like the community that I'm attached to. Maybe I want to live in a different one. Secession movements throughout the American West these, you know, when we think secession, we think civil war, we think north versus south, we think country level. 
but the, the overwhelming majority of secession movements in American history have been pieces of states that either want to become their own state or join a neighbor they like better. One of the longest lasting is called the state of Jefferson, which is between Oregon and California. This is a picture from, 18, uh, from uh, 1941 when the state of Jefferson announced that it was going to secede each Thursday until further notice. <laughs> And they set up little checkpoints <laughs> along the highways. They did this for about two weeks until Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and suddenly the country had more important things than the cranky people on the Oregon California line to deal with. 1992, the people of West Kansas decided that they didn't like being attached to the eastern part of their, you know, to heck with Topeka, let's secede on this hotel sign in western Kansas. Didn't happen. Uh, most recently, in 2013, there was an effort in my neck of the woods, part of northeastern Colorado, didn't like the rest of the government of the state of Colorado, and so either wanted to become their own state or wanted to become the Wyoming panhandle or whatever, and so they created their 51st state uh, secession movement. Sane Colorado wants to secede from crazy Colorado to become North Colorado. These, these secession movements are constant, and undoubtedly they would exist whether you had geographic or geometric borders, because whatever community you're living in, we're families, and families don't always get along. And maybe you look to the next family over and say, oh, I wish that invisible line wasn't there. So when we think about Doctors Without Borders, Teachers Without Borders, Clowns Without Borders, all, all of these groups, for the, the appeal that a borderless society has, at the end of the day, it's, it's not going to happen. Because boundaries have that practical value of helping to define law and order, of, of authority, of law enforcement, of property ownership. But they also create identities that people love, that people cherish. How much they love them, how much they cherish them, how, they, how far they're willing to go to protect and enforce those boundaries and those identities, that's a big political issue. But the fact that they exist is certainly nothing unique and is, is nothing that's going to change anytime soon. So when we look, <coughs> when you look at the map of the American West, when you look at the map of the United States, it's familiar. And yet it's important to remember that the familiarity that we have today is the result of nearly 200 years of fighting, of reinventing, of redrawing, and that the communities that exist today as cherished, as essential as they are to us, are the process, or are the end product of generations upon generations of historical negotiation, of a sorting process that we still experience to this day. So before I cut you loose to experience more boundary arguments, do you have any questions before I have to cut you loose for your next class. <laughs> All righty. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for helping to wrap up.